Okay, thank you. My topic tonight, uh, by assignment, is uh, the interpretation of the book of Genesis as the creation story. Um, you realize that the Bible starts off in the middle of a baseball game, and that in the beginning, things really started to happen. So much for the <laughs> crude joke. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to we'll try to make this a little more scientific from here on out. Okay. Um, Genesis one and one. It talks about in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I thought I would go a little bit about God, uh, the name God, what it means. In the ancient Masoretic, which is the Hebrew Bible, the name of God was always a four-letter called the Tetragamation. And that's because there are no vowels in Hebrew, only consonants. And so the spelling, whenever they wrote the word God, the spelling was J-H-J, it was J-H-W-H, or Y-H-W-H, or J-H-W-H, or Y-H-W-H. Now, now you're referring to the second chapter in Genesis, you know, not the first chapter. Well, I'm just starting off where it says, and, and in the beginning, God. I'm just starting with the word God, okay? <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to ask you about Elohim. We'll, we'll do, I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. Um, the Jews, uh, out of piousness, refused to say the name of God. They, at one time, knew how to pronounce it, but they decided not to pronounce it. It was too sacred. And so, after a couple generations, no one knew what it sounded like. No one knew how to pronounce it. All they had was those four letters. And... They had substituted, during the time when they refused to say the name of God, they substituted the word Adonai, which is a Hebrew word meaning the Lord. And, um, and so, so you start off in Genesis and other books that says, and the Lord God did this, and the Lord God did that. that they're adding here the word Adonai. Now, later on, uh, they decided that they wanted to know what, how to pronounce the name of God, but they had long since forgotten. So what they did is they took the word Adonai, and they inserted the vowel sounds of Adonai into the tetragamation. Okay? And when they do that, you, you come up with J-A-H-W-A-H which comes out to be Yahweh. And the English mutilization of that is Jehovah. And so that's how we get the name of God. Now, actually, many Hebrew names from the Bible contain the name of God in the name. And it comes in two forms. The El form for Elohim and the ayah form for Jehovah. And many Hebrew names were God is my help, um, I pray to God, God walks with me, and so forth and so on. Those are those were what the names actually meant. Now they were either spelled with an, <coughs> an <coughs> excuse me, the L form, which would be names like Daniel, you know, Ezekiel, E-L. Um, many, many names in Hebrew end in E-L, which stands for the name of God. And, uh, and you'll have Daniel and Ezekiel and so forth. Now you have also the name of God in the Ayah form, that is the Jehovah form. And you'll have names like Joshua, Names like Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Micah, and Mosiah, 
from the Book of Mormon. And so we find uh, some confusion as to whether God's name was El. In the plural form, it's Elohim. In, in Hebrew, you when you make a word plural, you don't put an S on the end of it. You put an H-I-M. And so you have El as one God and Elohim as gods with a, a plural. And so in Genesis 1.1, it says... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about God, the name God. The name actually in the Masoretic Hebrew is El Shaddai, which means the Almighty God. And it starts out, in the beginning, El Shaddai created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Israel fit in there too, the El Israel. Israel is Israel. one of those with the... Uh, Israel is a name which means prince with God. And it was Jacob's name when he wrestled with the angel. And he, the angel needed to go, and, and Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And so he said, your name is no more Jacob, which means the substitute, but Israel which means he who prevails with God, or prince with God. And um, so that's how we get the name Israel. And the E-L in Israel is the word God. Now, I'd like to introduce a term, a concept, that is not found in the Bible. This word is not found in the Bible. But it is a word which is well represented in the Bible in its connotation. The word is Shekinah. Shekinah. Shekinah is difficult to identify, define it purely, but it's a bright, brilliant light which represents the glory or presence of God. And it shows up in many, many places in the scriptures. For example, the burning bush. Moses saw a bush that was burning, but not consumed. And he said, I will go and see this thing. And as he approached the burning bush, he heard the voice of God saying, Remove the shoes from your feet, for you are standing on sacred ground. That brilliant light that appeared as a fire to Moses was the Shekinah. The pillar that <laughs> fought on the children of Israel for 40 years was the Shekinah. When the priest built Solomon's temple, and they moved the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies. They were very quickly driven out. <clears throat> they came running out of fear, afraid, because what was happening was the Shekinah. The Ark of the Covenant had on top of it the mercy seat where they expected God to sit. With the dedicated the temple, he came and sat there and the priests were so astonished, especially by the Shekinah, which filled the place with brilliance, that they ran from the temple. So there are many, many examples of, of the Shekinah. Um, Paul's experience on the way to Damascus, the beginning of Paul's experience is this brilliant light that knocks him to the ground and blinds him. This is the Shekinah. Joseph Smith said, as he knelt, there appeared a pillar of light above his head. And within that pillar of light, there were two personages. That pillar of light was the Shekinah. And so it occurs in many places. Um, when I was on my mission just recently, 
we were driving around, and my wife and I, and we came across this Baptist church in the countryside. And uh, they don't have names, but I mean, they don't have um, first ward, second ward, third ward type of thing. They all have names. The name of this one was the Shekinah Temple. I thought that was interesting. Where and was this? I took a photograph of it. So the term Shekinah represents the, God, the presence of God. Where were you on your mission? Where is that picture from? He was in Georgia. He was in Georgia. That was my second mission. We just returned about a year ago from, from Georgia. Now, so that's the concept of Shekinah. Now, what does that have to do with Genesis? Okay. Uh, when we start off in Genesis, what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse... It says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. But since the sun was not created until the fourth day in Genesis, that light could not have come from the sun. The light we're talking about here is the Shekinah. And so, it's basically saying that in the beginning, the one thing that existed was God. And his presence was manifested as the Shekinah. And so when it says, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the law, light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. You have to remember there's no sun involved here. So that what is defined as light here is the Shekinah. Now, verse 5 is one which has been mistranslated. It says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and morning were the first day. The word evening here comes from the Hebrew word Erev, E-R-E-V. Uh, Erev is a word, first of all, you need to understand, Hebrew only has 50,000 words. It's a small language, and so the words are used multiple times, and the context of the word determines its definition, especially since there's no vowels. An example would be the word cat in Hebrew is spelled C-T. The word caught is spelled C-T. The word cut is spelled C-T. So when you see it, how do you know what it's talking about? Well, the cut didn't run across the road and the caught didn't run across the road. It must have been a cat. Okay. I took the knife and accidentally cat myself. <laughs> caught myself. Or cut myself. And so it's, this is the kinds of problems that translators from Hebrew into languages, particularly English, struggled with that there are no vowel sounds, and so you need to know the context. The King James scholars and William Tyndall and, and Cloverdale and the others who did the translations into English, they struggled with this, not knowing exactly which word should be used. Now this word here, evening and morning were the first day, is an example of this. The word Erev, which is the Hebrew word that went here, has multiple meanings. It can mean evening. It can also mean disorganized. It can also mean chaos. It can also mean misunderstood. Because as evening approaches and things become duller and duller, they're more difficult to understand. They're more difficult to perceive they're more difficult to, 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 to interpret. 
And as the evening progresses further and further, that difficulty becomes greater and greater. And so, Erev can mean evening. It can also mean chaos. It can mean misunderstood. It can mean disorganized. Now, the word order or morning here is the word boker in Hebrew. Boker is the opposite of Erev. As the morning progresses, things become clearer, sharper, more organized, easier to understand, easier to see. And so the King James scholars took evening and morning for the first day. It was, first of all, it was poetic and it fit, but it's just as legitimate to say from chaos to order was the first day. I mean, between evening and morning with the first day and chaos to order in the first day, they are of equal weight. The King James scholars didn't know what it meant because they believed in what is known as ex nihilo creation. Ex nihilo is a Latin word which means out of nothing. So God said, let there be cows, and where there were nothing, suddenly there are cows. We don't believe in ex nihilo creation. But most of the Christian world does. And so when God said something, then suddenly out of nothing it, it appeared. That's called ex nihilo creation. We don't believe that. And primarily because the poor great price said, let us go down, for there is matter here. And we will take of this matter and we will organize it. It didn't say, let us go down here because it's void and empty and there's nothing there and we will create something that was not there before. We don't believe that. And so this idea of evening, morning, was the first day, it's probably more legitimate to say from disorder to order occurred on the first day. And as we go through the here, it's always the same. Evening and morning with the second day, and evening and morning with the third day, and evening and morning with the fourth day, and so forth and so on. We're not talking about a time frame here, from evening to morning being a time. We're talking about a process from chaos, from disorder to order occurred on the first day. That process was repeated on the second day and that process of becoming more ordered was the third day and so forth and so on. And so I think that that's a, that's a mistranslation. It's, it's, it's not so much mistranslated, it's misunderstood. King James scholars didn't know what we know. And so for them, it was ex nihilo creation. God just said, and then suddenly, where there was nothing, there was something. Okay. All right. What's the next one here? I made notes. I didn't get lost. I'm already lost. Okay. I think it's important that we realize here that we're not talking about a time frame from evening to morning, but a process of what happened on the first day and the second day. Moreover, you have to remember there was no sun. So how long a day was, it's open. It's not from, and, and that's where the King James scholars have, have tracked us on the wrong direction. They're saying from evening to morning was a day, that's a time. But the fact is it was a process, and how long that process took is, is not clear from destroying Genesis. So the idea that the earth is created in six days, that doesn't mean six periods as we understand them. It was a process, over, and it probably took 
a long, long time to do. Now, they're talking about the creation of life on the earth. Let me see if that's where I want to go next here. Oh, okay. The sun was created on the fourth day. And so it's interesting to see what it says about the fourth day. It says the sun was created. This is in verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the light from the night, the day from the night. And that there be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. So not only was the sun created on the fourth day, but time was created on the fourth day. There's no time for the first three days. Time was created on the fourth day when the sun was created. And, and everything that we measure time-wise has to do with the sun. And so, this is, so the question comes now, did Adam see any stars? If the earth is created in six days, the closest stars to the earth is Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri, and Bernard's star. It's a three-star system which lies approximately four light years from the Earth. So it would have had to been four years before Adam would have seen those three stars, and much longer for the others. That is, if we want to squeeze creation into six days. But if you don't put time in there, then, of course, you have an infinite time for the light to reach the Earth. But the minimal time, for a star to be seen on the earth was four years. And so the question comes up, did Adam and Eve see the star? Well, if they saw those three, Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri, and Bernard's star, it had to be four years after they were created. Just something to think about. You can see that the King James scholars made this very poetic but scientifically, it doesn't fit. If you think it through. Okay. Um, this brings me to verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life, and the fowls that may fly above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. The word life in verse 20 is nefesh. Nefesh is a Hebrew word which can mean life. It can also mean spirit. It can also mean fire. It can also mean wind. So you have your choice. It's like the cat, the cot, and the cut. You, you put in there which one you think fits. And so in this particular case, they took the word nefesh and they put the word life in there. Now what makes this interesting is if you go to verse 2, chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2 talks about the creation of man. And it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostril the, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now we have the word life used two places here, back in chapter 1 and here in chapter 2. But in Hebrew, in English, it's the same word, life. In Hebrew, it's not the same word. The word in chapter 1 is nefesh. 
the word in chapter 2 is Nashama. So, chapter 1 in Hebrew would have said this. And God said, let the waters bring forth life abundantly, the moving creatures, I know, bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have enough fish. In chapter 2, it said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the neshama. So what's the difference between a nefesh and a neshama? Well, the word ne part is the same. Nefesh, neshama. That root would mean spirit. But yama comes from the word name. And so here in chapter 2 it says, And God breathed it in the nostrils, a spirit with a name. And man became a living soul. I think that's a big difference. Because the spirit that went into Adam had a name before it was put in there. And the name was Michael. And I think every one of us have a neshama, which God knows personally by name. And so the King James scholars translated that word as life in both places, making you think that they're equal, but they're not. A nefesh and a neshama are not the same. Man has a neshama. All other living animals have a nefesh. Now, this is this is Jensen gospel here. Okay, you take it or leave it. I think there's no question from the evidence that human-like beings lived on this earth up to 200,000 years ago. <clears throat> but they probably had a nefesh, not a neshama. Adam was the first with the neshama, and all of his children were born with a neshama, a spirit with a name, an identity. It's also known as the soul of man. So the others did not have a soul. Okay. Now, were there dinosaurs in the Bible? Is there any evidence of dinosaurs in the Bible? Well, I know you're anxious to hear this. It talks about the fact that as God created things, he created the great whales. Okay, so let's see, where did he, where did he create the great whales? Verse 21. What verse? 21. 21. Okay. Now, the term here, for great whales. The term here is taninum. It's taninum gerogolium, which means big whales. But the word taninum is found one other place in the Bible. When Moses and Aaron appeared before Pharaoh, Aaron cast down his rod and it turned into a taninum. Now, either one or two things. It either turned into a reptile or it turned into a whale. You take your pick. 
but the word is the same. The great whales here, and what came from Aaron's staff were the same word. So if we believe that Adam's or Aaron's staff turned into a reptile, then right here in 21 it says, and God created the great reptiles. Now, the King James scholars didn't know anything greater than a whale. Whales are the biggest thing that they could think of. So they translated this word into whales. It was the biggest thing they knew. They didn't know about reptiles that were as big as a house. And so this scripture here says, and God created the great reptiles, or the great whales. That word whales could be reptile. So God created the great reptiles. And so that would be dinosaurs. King James College didn't know this. You have to understand about the translation. There were many people who translated the Bible from Greek into Hebrew, or I mean into English, Greek into English. There are two Bibles. We have the Subjuident, which is a Greek form, and we have the Misoretic, which is a Hebrew form. If you remember from your Bible story and your history, the children of Israel were taken captive into Babylon for 70 years. They were released from captivity by the Persians who invaded Babylon, destroyed the Babylonian captivity um, civilization, and released the Jews to return to Jerusalem. But the Persians didn't stop there. They continued to expand. And in their expansion, they eventually came into the southern part of Europe and dropped down into Greece. Now, they were blocked in Greece in a battle north of Athens in the plains of Marathon. And the Persians were the mightiest army in the world, but the Greeks defeated them at Marathon. And one of the Greek soldiers <laughs> ran from the plains of Marathon into Athens to tell the people that they did not have to fear. And it's 26 miles from the plains of Marathon into Athens. And that's where we get the race we call the Marathon. Now, the king of the Greeks at that time was Philip II. His son, Alexander, decided that the Persians were not going to get a second chance to invade Greece. So he drove them out of Greece to the north and swept them into Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey in the Middle East today, and drove them all the way to the Persian Gulf. And then they crossed the Persian Gulf into India. And then there was a rebellion against Alexander by his generals. And they said, Alex, baby, you know how far we are from home? It takes the mail forever to get here. Let's go home. And so Alexander said, OK. So Alexander never conquered India. He was on the verge when his men persuaded him to go home. Crossing back over through Iraq at the Persian Gulf, he got malaria and died of malaria. So they divided his conquerings among his five generals. His most able general was Ptolemy I who was a great scholar in his own right, and he inherited both Israel, what we call Israel today, but Egypt. He built a city in Egypt named after his patron, Alexander, which is Alexandria, Egypt. 
and it had a great seaport. And it was his goal to collect every written word, every word that had ever been written, he wanted it. And he built this magnificent library. And he sent out his men, and they collected every single written word, every book. His librarian, now, Ptolemy was succeeded by <coughs> his son, Ptolemy II, who continued his father's work. Demetrius, who was his librarian, said, Ptolemy, there's one important book we do not have, and we can't get it. He said, yes, you can. He says, no, we can't get this one. It is the Hebrew Bible. He said, well, there must be some way for us to get it. He said, well, our agents are working on it. They talked to the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders who ruled Israel. The 70 elders agreed that they would not allow them to have a copy of the Bible, but they would allow them to translate it in Jerusalem, under the auspices of the Sanhedrin, which is made up of 70 elders. And so the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek under the direction of the 70 elders of Israel. And it's called the Septuagint, after the number 70. And so that's how we got the Bible from Hebrew into Greek. Now, because Alexander's influence had covered much of the Western Mediterranean, or Eastern Mediterranean at that time, that became a very popular, everything was in Greek. Now, I think it's interesting that the Book of Mormon, Brass Poets of Laban, had a copy of the Bible. It was not subjugant. It was Masoretic. So as we as we go through the Book of Mormon and we find Isaiah quoted again and again and again and again. But it's not always the same as Isaiah that we have in the Bible. Because the Isaiah we have in the Bible is a Greek Isaiah. The Book of Mormon Isaiah would be Masoretic. And there, there were differences there. And that's one of the reasons that, the, that you find differences in the Book of Mormon Isaiah versus the, the King James Isaiah. Because one is from the Greek and the other one is from the Masoretic. So the Masoretic Bible is a replica of the Bible that the Sanhedrin allowed Ptolemy to translate into Greek. Yes, but they kept it in Hebrew. They let the Greek go. Right. Take it. Okay. And so the, the today the Torah and the Mishnah and the other writings of the Jews are from the Masoretic, not from the Septuagint. Whereas the King James, the King James Bible is from the Greek. And so there are differences between the two because of that. I have a book where they've compared the Book of Mormon Isaiah with uh, the other Septuagint. <laughs> Yeah, and where they differ in the Book of Mormon and the Bible, they're the same in the Masoretic, or similar. Yeah. They're more uh, similar to the Masoretic, where you find the differences. Yeah, they would have, uh, one would have a, a verse that the other wouldn't have, and then the Book of Mormon would have both verses. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating study between, to try to study the uh, Isaiah from the Hebrew, from, from one or the other, you know. The Book of Mormon falls in between. The Hebrew Bible, the Torah, is Masoretic. 
Whereas the Bible we have is Septuagint. It's a Greek. It's a Greek translation. So it went from Hebrew to Greek and then into English. And so there are there are inevitable mistranslations. Yeah, part of the con conclusion of that study was the biggest differences is that as the scribes were translating and they'd see something they didn't like, they'd leave it out in both of them and it was they'd it find it in the Book of Mormon. He did. Isaiah. They did. Yeah, when my wife and I were in Israel this last, uh, before we went on our mission, um, we saw a scribe down at um, Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And he was in a booth, it was air-conditioned, and it was totally soundproof. He just ignored us. But he was copying, it was interesting. He had a Torah scroll here, and he had another scroll here that was empty. And you could see him. He would read the word, whatever word it was, okay, God, God, and he would spell it. Then he would read God, go back to God, and he'd take the next one, and he would do the same thing. And you could see that he was very careful about the way he did this. We're not so sure that scribes through the ages were so careful. Because there was a lot of political pressure. There were times when the Jewish nation was m messianic. And there were other times when they were not a messianic. And so you would find the scribes being pressured one way or the other in, the, in their copying of the scriptures. And so it's hard to say where those changes occurred. The other thing you have to realize is that the the Tyndall, the King James scholar, the King James Bible is primarily from William Tyndall. The 54 scholars put together by King James did very little translating. What they did is they compared what they had with Tyndall's writings. And if they were, if they liked the way Tyndall did it, they kept Tyndall. So most of what we have in the English Bible is from William Tyndall. William Tyndall was captured by the Inquisition and put to death by the Catholics for his work on the Bible. But, so what did the King James scholars do? The 54 scholars, which, because we use what is known as the King James Version. They already had a good translation. They had Tyndall's translation. They had Coverdale's translation as well. There were 54 scholars in three institutions in England. It took several years. Now, <clears throat> how they got together was the fact that Henry VIII wanted a divorce from Catherine of Aragon who was his queen. She was the queen of Spain. And he wrote to the Pope, and the Pope denied him a divorce. So Henry captured all of the church lands in England and created the Church of England to replace the Catholic Church in all of those lands. Now, from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, he had a daughter named Mary, but he wanted a son. And so, Mary went back to Spain. He divorced Catherine of Aragon, the Queen of Spain, and married Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn bore him a son who was a kind of a weakly son. He got tired of Anne Boleyn and got rid of her and married Anne of Cleves. And when it was all over, the succession was so messed up that they didn't know who was going to be the next king. So Mary, who was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, she claimed the throne. 
and she came back from Spain and she claimed the throne of England. But to get rid of all of the Protestants that Henry VIII had put in place, she killed them all. And she became known as Bloody Mary. Well, the Parliament didn't put up with that, and they booted her out. And they brought in Elizabeth as queen. Now, Elizabeth was afraid to have any offspring because of such a turmoil. So she was the virgin queen, Elizabeth I. The colony of Virginia is named after her, the virgin queen. And she had no offspring. When she died, they put in Jane Grey, Lady Jane Grey. She only lasted a couple of weeks, and they put her to death. So now the English throne was empty. However, Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a cousin of Elizabeth, had a son by the name of James the Sixth of Scotland. He was educated in the French courts, which were Catholic. He was the head of the Church of Scotland, which was Presbyterian. And so his religious affiliations were weak. I mean, he didn't have strong affiliations between any of them. They offered him the throne of England, and James the Sixth of Scotland became James the First of England. And because his religious, you know, he was blasé about religion, he then authorized what we call the King James Version. And, um, and they used most of the Tyndall's translation. But what they did do is they put everything in a very poetic form. They really cleaned up the English rather than the translation. And so the King James Version, it, the beauty of the King James Version is due to the 54 scholars. They tried to make it as poetic as they could. And it is, it is beautiful. I mean, it is magnificent. And so there's, the King James scholars didn't do much translating as much as they did polishing the English. Made it into the 1560, which is the apex of the English language. It was Shakespearean. So, so I'm just about done with uh, the creation story. But you see, it's gone through, there's many, many translational issues in that, as we have it in the Bible. So we should enjoy it. You were talking about when Nebuchadnezzar carried the Jews into Babylonia, and then it was uh, <coughs> Cyrus that came in and freed them. And yeah gave them all the things from the temple and sent them back. Uh, the 45th chapter of Isaiah, mentioned Cyrus. Yeah, 200 years before, gave the name of Cyrus and told what he was going to do. <laughs> and Cyrus was so impressed when that was pointed out to him that he freed the Jews and told them to go back and rebuild the temple. Gave them some money and sent them home. Because of the Isaiah, what, what Isaiah had written. Now, if you if you give me five more minutes, I'd like to make a quick zip through Isaiah. Isaiah is a book which is either greatly beloved or greatly hated. But Isaiah is a book of poetry. We have the Psalms, and we have the Proverbs, and we have the Song of Solomon, all which are poetic. There is not a book that compares to Isaiah when it comes down to poetry. It is the most poetic of all. Now, you have to understand, in English, our poetry is by sound. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I will tell you, anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. And so we, we rhyme the end words. 
that's the way English poetry is. Ah, yes, I wrote The Purple Cow. I'm sorry now I wrote it. But I will tell you anyhow. I'll kill you if you quote it. It's a remick. And that's the way English poetry is. But Hebrew poetry is not. You state a thought. Then using totally different words, you repeat that thought. Then you state a new thought. And then using totally different words, you repeat the thought. So there's a parallelism, you see. The first line always parallels the second line. But the words are totally different. But the thought is the same. You state a thought, then you repeat the thought. Using totally different. Now, you go through, you can go through the Psalms and you can see that pattern over and over and over and over and over and over and over. But Isaiah is written in poetry. And so where people get stumbled up is thinking that there's two thoughts there. But in fact, there's one thought that's repeated and a thought and it's repeated. There's a thought that's repeated. And, um, is that uh, where chiasmus came from? Well, the, now the chiasma is a similar, but you take a book, I mean, I mean a section, you state the thought on the first verse, or the first, then you repeat the thought using different words in the last verse. And then the second verse is repeated in the second to the last, and the third verse in the third to the last, and the fourth verse in the fourth to the last. Now eventually you're going to come to the middle, at the middle is the crossover point, where the chiasmus cross over. The, the theme, the, the message, the prophecy, is always at the crossover point. And it can be pretty magnificent. Um, there are more chiasmus in the Book of Mormon than there is in the Bible. And some of them, there's some magnificent chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. It just, it just, if you go through the Book of Mormon and study the chiasmus, it's just amazing. And the thing about it is that they didn't know anything about chiasmus until the, something like the 30s or 40s. And yet the Book of Mormon has had some of the most magnificent chiasmus that you'll ever find in the scriptures. And um, so it's uh, internal. I, you know, we talk about all these jungle cities and pyramids and all that stuff down there, those are external evidences of the Book of Mormon. But the internal, the internal evidences to the Book of Mormon are far more powerful. Far more powerful. So, okay, I'm done. <laughs>